Hello, and welcome to the Weights and Measures Primer. My name is Ross Anderson. This is part two of a video dealing with the risks in testing. I do encourage you to watch part one before this one and explains sort of where this is all coming from. I focus on the question. Normally, people think of asking about uncertainties, but I show that risks is more appropriate because the output of a testing verification is a pass-fail decision. And as such, the mistakes we make are not measurement errors, they're decision errors where we pass things that are not compliant and we fail things that are compliant. And this is the risk we need to deal with because we don't know the uncertainties of the measurements. We don't know the actual distribution of the population. We can't really calculate the risks, but we can simulate the risks using Monte Carlo. I go on to describe the Monte Carlo method I will use, and that includes explicit treatment of the rounding that occurs on both the instrument scale and the verification scale. The final part of the part one dealt with the instruments that we would simulate. And I picked a handful of instruments that I believe will be representative and we can learn a lot from. This is that table and you'll see the center stripe there, the green one is the LP meter. And I will start with that one because the resolution is high enough both on the instrument scale and the verification scale. We then will look at starting resolution where the VTM stood out and then ending resolution where the motor fuel dispenser tests and the class three scale stood out. So let's begin with the LP test. This is how I've chosen to represent the outcomes of the simulations. And let me give a little orientation. Up at the top, you see the title, the effects of test variability. And I give the instrument, the starting and ending resolution and the target percent non-compliance. The y-axis is pretty simple. It's simply the percent of the population. The x-axis is a fraction, two standard deviations of the test divided by the tolerance, which is sort of the inverse of the test uncertainty ratio, where we usually talk about the tolerance divided by the uncertainty of the measurement. Essentially, what we're doing is we're comparing the test variability to the tolerance. I'm plotting four lines from the simulation results. The first is the red line which represents the actual failures. You will see that it's not a smooth line because there is some sampling error in how the simulator produces these errors. Next, we plot the purple and orange lines. These represent the false positives in purple and the false negatives in orange. Then I plot the blue line, which represents the test failures. The test failures are always equal to the actual noncompliance plus the false negatives minus the false positives. A final note that I will be simulating at the equivalent of test uncertainty ratios of infinity, 10 to 1, 6 to 1, 4 to 1, 3 to 1, 2 to 1, and 1 and a half to 1. And in each point, I will be doing 20,000 simulations. That's a total of 140,000 simulated tests, which the computer can do in a matter of seconds question becomes, where do we focus our attention? The place to start is to think about if the only source of variability occurred from the reference standard, the field standard. With LP, the tolerance on the field standard is 0.2 gallons. The maintenance tolerance is one gallon. So that's one-fifth or a five to one ratio. But because the field standard is verified by calibration verification, we can say with some certainty that there's about a 100% chance that what leaves the lab is within the applicable tolerance. But I'm plotting the curve at two standard deviations, not three. So we need to take two thirds of the standard tolerance when plotting on the graph. Next, we'll look for an upper limit of the total variability. If we add the standard and the test method, we get the total, but they don't just add together, they combine as the root sum square. So if we choose 0.33 as an upper limit, 
what we'll get is approximately one third of the maintenance tolerance in variability of the test. But remember, that's two sigma, not three. Now we can solve for the contribution of the method by solving this equation for the method when we know the total and the standard. And we see that the method combines 84% of the variability at this level. This we can see by looking at the following table. Here we see the contribution of the procedure and the standard at the points that we're testing at, 0 0.167, 0 0.25, 0 0.33. And we can see that the contribution of the standard drops rapidly and the procedure takes over as the dominant force. And we see from this chart why the one-third rule for reference standards is so effective. It might seem lax, but basically the test method becomes the dominant source of variability. Now we come back to our graph and we see that I've added a green line along the bottom to mark our area of interest. And what we see when we look at this is that the variability doesn't seem to affect the false positives and false negatives. It's almost a flat line. And what we're seeing is something like 98 to 96% effectiveness of the test. So the point is, even though we have huge changes in variability of the test, we see very little change in the outcomes. And this basically shows why testing is so effective and why it's used by organizations like AOAC, ASTM, IEEE, and OML and Weights and Measures. Before leaving LP, I want to also do a couple other compliance rates. So I bracketed the 8% that I started with at 6% and 10%. So what we're seeing is at 10%, we lose a little bit of effectiveness over 6%, but it's really pretty small. One last thing before I leave LP. LP is unique in that we don't stop at 100.0 on the instrument scale in our testing. Rather, we stop at a random point when the liquid gets into the middle of the gauge on the prover. Therefore, we're fully rounding off the instrument scale and the verification scale. And it doesn't matter whether it's analog or digital. That will become important when we move now to look at the starting resolution. With the VTM, we have this situation where there is a slight difference between a digital VTM and an analog VTM. And that's what we see plotted here. The difference is on a digital VTM, the rounding when we stop at 100.0 is plus or minus a half a scale division. But with an analog indicator, the inspector tries to stop right at the graduation. The analog rounding is thus reduced, and I'm going to estimate it as a resolution of five cubic inches. When we look at the results, what stands out? If you look carefully, what stands out is that the orange line on the left hand figure is elevated. And it's elevated by about a half a percent, six tenths of a percent. And that is consistent across the whole range of the x-axis. So the digital start resolution of one third of the maintenance tolerance increases the false negatives. Well, I wanted to re-verify that. So I looked at this with another instrument and I chose to do it with a 20 liter test of a motor fuel device. We're going to use 50 milliliter scale divisions as our starting resolution. Now I can do this with the simulator, but you can't do it in real life because manufacturers don't make motor fuel dispensers with 0.05 liter graduation. Now what we see is the false negatives have actually gone up further. There are about one and a half percent false negatives because of the decreased resolution. This led me to consider looking at multiple resolutions. And so what I did was I ran the motor fuel dispenser with 20 liters with starting resolutions starting at 10 milliliters, then going to 20, to 33 and a third, to 50, and finally 100 milliliter resolution. 
And what we see on the left-hand side, the false negatives start out increasing slowly and then they increase a lot. On the right-hand side, the false positives seem to be almost unaffected, just slightly when we go up to 100 milliliter resolution. The point is that if we have a start resolution that's at least one third of the maintenance tolerance or smaller, the false negatives will be relatively small and within acceptable risks. Now we begin to look at end resolution. And what I'm looking at in the first set of graphs is the 20 liter test of a motor fuel dispenser. And the figure on the left is with 20 milliliter graduations on the prover and on the right is 10 milliliters. In 2010, Handbook 105.3 was changed to call for higher resolution on the neck. They went from a four inch neck to a three inch neck and reduced the division size by half. When we compare the two graphs, what stands out immediately is the elevation in the false positives. It goes from about 1% up to about 1.6%. So as we saw before on the false negatives, the resolution here has a effect on the false positives. But also look at the false negatives. You'll see that the orange line on the figure on the left has been slightly lowered, and this is important. This is also true of the five gallon test, very similar graphs of the five gallon test measure with one cubic inches versus one half cubic inch graduations. But to really see the effect of end resolution, let's look at the class three scales. And the figure on the left is the first tolerant step, figure on the right is the second tolerant step. Everything seems to have gone crazy. The false positives are well over 4%, and the false negatives have dropped to nearly zero. So what's going on? Well, what's going on is that end resolution is highly important in getting the tolerances right. R76 requires that you resolve the errors to at least 0.2e. So let's look at the graphs if we now change the figures and resolve the errors to 0.2e. These two figures should look very, very similar to the 20 liter or five gallon tests we just got done looking at. By reducing the resolution to at least one fifth of the maintenance tolerance, we get the errors within reasonable risks. Now you can use error weights or direct reading when D is equal to 0.2E or 0.1E for class one and two. Here's the second tolerance step reduced to 0.2E resolution. And you can see this is getting us back to our normal figure where the false positives and false negatives are about the same. So the science tells us that this one fifth of the maintenance tolerance as a resolution for the testing is about the lower limit. And it turns out that R76 requires one fifth and Handbook 133 actually uses one sixth, about the same thing. But the other thing is that pushing beyond one-tenth of the maintenance tolerance is generally not cost-effective. As I did before with the false negatives, I'm going to look at varying the end resolution this time, keeping the start resolution the same. In this case, we're going to use the motor fuel dispenser with 10 milliliter divisions as the starting resolution. But we're going to vary the end resolution starting at 10 milliliters, 20 milliliters, 33.3, 50 milliliters, and 100 milliliters. So we're going from one tenth of the tolerance all the way up to equal to the tolerance. But now look at these graphs and you can see that false positives also affect the false negatives. As the false positives go up, the false negatives go down. We didn't see that before with start resolution. So what we can do is we can look at this graph and we can see that there's sort of a bottom line at one fifth of the maintenance tolerance. That should be our starting point. We should not go higher than that in resolving the errors. If we do, we're gonna have a increase in false positive and a damping effect on the false negatives. If we go back and look at the starting resolutions, very different picture. And the point is that we can push further up to about one third, maybe even one half maintenance tolerance on the start resolution and not really lose too much in terms of risk. I'll show it to you in another way. 
start in this figure by looking at the bell curve as the population of instruments. So these are the errors in the instruments that we're testing. And what we're seeing is that roughly 5% of the errors are outside the tolerance limit, 2.5% on either tail. When the resolution is equal to the maintenance tolerance, that's the bottom bar, you'll see that the false positive region, that half a division of rounding, eats up virtually all of the 2.5%. That's why we were seeing close to 4% false positives when we had resolution equal to the maintenance tolerance. But as we reduce it down to a half, to a quarter, to one-fifth, to one-sixth, we see that the proportion of green space above the tolerance decreases and it sort of, sort of tapers down. One of the concerns was that this was going to cost a lot of time and effort for our inspectors to be out there using error weights to determine these errors. But I don't think it's that big a deal. If the error is not at the tolerance value by direct reading, then we don't need error weights at all. But if the indication is at the tolerance value, there's a simple go, no go test. If it's at the plus tolerance value, you add four tenths of an E in error weights and the indication must remain where it is. At the minus tolerance level, you add 0.6 E and the indication must increase 1 E. But I need to dig a little further into this idea of risk. Up till now, risk has been an issue of probability of something happening. But a risk analysis typically considers not only the probability that something happens, but the seriousness of the impact. We can use the Monte Carlo simulations to give some visual representation to our decision errors. And in this case, what I'm doing is plotting a histogram of 2,000 tests of an LP simulation. The green represents compliant instruments that were passed. The red are non-compliant instruments that were failed. That's not what we're interested in. We're interested in the purple and the orange. The false positives are in purple and the false negatives are in orange. And because risk juxtaposes probability and severity, we see that testing yields low probability of injury and low severity of injury. That's the real power of testing. In the fundamental considerations, we see that tolerances are set to prevent serious injury to either buyer or seller. But the Handbook 44 tolerance should not be thought of as a dividing line. Your serious injury if you're out of tolerance. No, if it was, we would demand 100% compliance, but we don't. Tolerance needs to be thought of as an action level. Once you get beyond this point, we force you back to the middle and keep everybody consistent. The other thing to consider is that you have to look at this situation after the inspection. After the inspection, the devices that are rejected are lumped back in the middle. And so we see the as found condition and the final condition. And so the only mistakes we're making in terms of what's left in the marketplace are these little purple tails on either end. And our testing represents low risk, low probability of occurrence and low probability of severe harm. Why are we asking about risks? Why are we concerned? Because we lost confidence in testing. And that was all because someone used a different reference standard and a new test procedure that produced a slightly different result. If we look at the definition of errors of over-registration and under-registration, the critical thing is the indications are greater or less than they should be. All of a sudden, we were no longer sure what they should be. And it turns out that uncertainty, even if we knew it, wasn't going to help. And what's the problem? Test bias. Monte Carlo can only address variables of predictable sources. That's the things that show up if we did control charts or other things to monitor variability. 
but biases occur in all methods. And we find them using external controls. And our testing regimens have overlapping external controls that you may not think about. For example, each inspector is overlapped by multiple service technicians. And in fact, you will usually see that the service technician is also overlapped by multiple inspectors. They're always checking on each other. Now, these external controls are really very effective. And we know that because there are often cases where the inspector and the serviceman are disagreeing, and that gets resolved pretty quickly. The closed loop prover system that prompted the alternative standards group was a perfect example of external controls working. The other one I'll tell a quick story is there was a rack meter prover purchased by a state under the low bid. And what they found when they took it out in the field is the results didn't agree with the service person. They went through a lot of work to figure out that it was a problem in the design of the prover. It wasn't the accuracy of the prover, it wasn't the inspector, it was the design of the prover. And it rapidly came to the head because of these external controls. Now, these bias issues is why I believe there should be one official method and why NCWM should follow the approach of one official method. It's basically a focus on the forest making all the trees the same. And it's something that AOAC, ASTM, all have official methods. R76 and OIML, for example, have a one method approach. They choose their true value by convention. You can see these definitions of the conventional value is attributed by agreement. In other words, we agree that this test produces the true value. And what I'm suggesting is that test bias has to be uniform to provide for fair competition. When you pick one method, you have to pick the best method. But this is where people usually get it wrong. The best test is chosen for efficiency in cost and time. The cheapest effective test is the best test. And what I'm suggesting is that alternative test methods are, can be recognized, but they must produce equivalent results to the best test. Now, what these terms, uh, effective and equivalent, actually mean is something that we should work on and we should reform uh, the alternative test methods work group and basically recognizes that it's okay to have a more expensive test provided it gives you the same results. The population mean is obviously important then because if we get one test, we'll have one mean, different tests will have a different mean. Well, so one test says this is the one we want to use. But what about the standard deviation of the tests? Well, it turns out that what Monte Carlo told us is the variability is far less critical than getting the mean right. And I think that follows along with what we're doing in Handbook 133. So let me sort of recap with five lessons that we learn about testing verification. The result of a verification is a compliance decision, not a measurement, and we want to ensure low risks of bad decisions. The one-third rule of the standard is effective because the contribution of the standard to the variability is kept quite small relative to the tolerances. Next, small differences in variability in the test method are not significant since test variability has very little impact on our compliance decisions. The rounding, the start and ending rounding is often very significant. So keep them to an appropriate fraction of the maintenance tolerance. And finally, the bias between test methods is our primary concern. So our conclusion, well, the risks involved in testing verification are low. As I explained, low severity and low probability of occurrence. Our false positives, one to 2% of the population, 
it's interesting that buyers and sellers share this cost evenly. The false negatives, on the other hand, also are about 1% to 2% of the population. But the instrument owners and the regulatory officials bear the cost of this risk. Think about it. The owner bears the cost of the service call, and the regulatory official bears the cost of an additional inspection. Now, finally, my conclusion is that bias is controlled by the choice of the official method. Small biases within the uncertainty have no impact on profit or loss, and I think this is an important consideration. The science tells us that risks are low. We can have confidence in testing. Really fit with a quote I found in my research from Norman Schultz. It costs resources to avoid risks. Unreasonably cautious policies promise to be exceedingly expensive or extremely low on the cost-benefit scale. In other words, don't make this into a bigger problem than it has to be. Testing works just fine. And thus brings to a close our assessment of the risks in testing. And I hope that when you go forth and now begin testing scales in the future, you realize that we can have a lot of confidence in testing. Testing works. Thank you for listening.